tornadoes. Terrifying and thankfully rare. But they're also fascinating and even beautiful. And it would really be cool if you could create a tornado whenever you wanted to in your shop or at home. And today we're going to show you how to build a machine that allows you to do that. But to understand the design, we're gonna to have to touch lightly on some aerodynamics and some thermodynamics, but I, no equations. Now, the air molecules that surround us at sea level and at room temperature are traveling very rapidly, about 330 meters per second, or about 760 miles per hour. That is the same as the speed of sound. It's actually what defines the speed of sound. You can't transmit information or sound through a medium any faster than the messengers are traveling. Because those particles are moving so quickly, they're constantly bouncing off of each other and the recoiling from all of the surfaces. And because of the conservation of momentum, mass times velocity, <laughs> one equation. As they recoil, they exert a minuscule force onto that surface. And because there are gazillions of them striking the surface every second, it amounts to a pretty appreciable force. And if you divide that force by the area, you have a pressure. Now you might think for a second, wait, mass times velocity. What if we replaced all of the air molecules with helium atoms under the same conditions? Does the pressure drop? No because the helium atoms are traveling far faster, over a thousand meters per second. In addition, because they're traveling faster, they're striking the surface more frequently. Those effects counteract and the pressure remains the same. What if you increased the velocity? You heated the gas, would the pressure increase? No, because as the gas heats, the molecules move farther apart. There are fewer of them there and fewer impacts per second. Again those factors counteract and the pressure stays the same. Now, that pressure is isotropic, meaning it's the same in every direction because the molecules are moving randomly in every direction. However, if you have a flow of air or a stream of air from a fan or a blower, because as long as this doesn't heat the air, the mean velocity stays the same. A larger fraction of it is moving along with the stream. And the only way to conserve momentum, to keep the mean velocity the same, the motion in the lateral direction has to decrease. The velocity has to decrease and therefore the pressure decreases. So for example, if I take this fan and I turn it up a little bit, you can see that it obviously pushes up on the card higher velocity on this direction than in this direction, and so it pushes the card up. But it also does, in fact, decrease the pressure laterally, and I can prove that as well. I'm gonna take a little bin here with some warm water in it, and I'm gonna add some dry ice to make some fog. You can see the fog just falls down along the surface because it's cold and it's dense. If I turn up the fan, watch what happens to the fog. Now, because the fan is so loud, I'm going to mute this and explain to you what's happening. You can see the fog being drawn into the upstream from the fan. It's not actually being pulled into the intake or blasted away by the exhaust. The high pressure where the fog is being generated is driving it into the upstream because it's a lower pressure inside the upflowing stream of air. It's pretty impressive. But there's another way I can demonstrate this. When I was a kid, my parents would take me shopping and often at the store, they would have a display of vacuum cleaners and you gotta admit, vacuum cleaners are not sexy. So they would often levitate a ball like this in order to draw attention to the vacuums and show how powerful they are. Now the fact that the ball levitates against gravity, well that makes sense, more force or more velocity against the bottom of the ball. But the fact that it doesn't leave the stream, that even when I perturb it, it returns to the stream is because it's trapped in a low pressure region. 
surrounded by the high pressure air that's moving very, very slowly. It's pretty impressive. I used to watch this for long periods of time. I was fascinated by it. Now, if you have enough juice and a powerful enough blower, you can actually double this up. Neat. Isn't science wonderful? Whew, that's loud. That fact that the low pressure in the updraft of the stream entrains or draws air into it produces the bulk of the kinetic energy that drives a tornado. As the ground level air is drawn into that stream, it generates a tremendous amount of power. The problem, though, is that is a rather diffuse entrainment of air. It's not a very concentrated amount of destructive force. There's a second component that makes a tornado so devastating, and that requires that that kinetic energy be concentrated in a small region. And what does that is the creation of a vortex. And what creates the vortex is wind shear. What concentrates that energy is the same thing that takes an ice skater and appears to increase the velocity as you pull your hands inward. Now what's interesting is when an ice skater does that and they appear to spin faster and faster, there's no added kinetic energy from that. The fingertips of the ice skater out here are traveling just as fast when they're right by their chest. It doesn't seem like that, but it's true. The reason that the ice skater spins up, the RPMs increase, is because of the conservation of momentum, the fingertips don't accelerate, but because they're following a much smaller radius, in order to be at the same velocity, the skater has to turn more quickly, and that's what happens with a vortex. In air, in a tornado, we need to do that drawing in by the use of wind shear. Let me show you how that works over here. Now, what I have over here, is a pot with some warm water in it. And I'm going to put some dry ice in here so that you're going to be able to see the wind shear effect. I've got four small computer fans mounted around the pot and they're tangential. So they create sort of a rotational motion to the fog. So I'm going to add a little bit of dry ice here and you're going to see this. Now, if you look carefully, you can see that the air is not just being blown out. It's actually rotating. And this is what's critical to form the tornado. The next thing you need is the updraft. So add a little bit more. And I've got another fan. You can see how that's spinning is concentrating to a small column right in the middle. Now you skeptics out there might think, is the wind shear really necessary? Maybe this is all happening just because of the updraft from the fan that I'm holding in my hand. Let me show you that that's not true. I'm going to turn off the lateral fans. See what happens? You still get a, little, a few streams coming up into this vertical fan, but there's no real concentration, no real vortex. But when I turn these fans back on again, Once again, we have our tornado. You need both. Now in a meteorologic, a real tornado, what causes it is that you'll have a storm front or you'll have a supercell at a higher altitude in the place of very high velocity, high altitude winds. This air is very cold and is overtaking the warmer air near the ground. As it does so, because it's dense 
and it's cold, it begins to fall. That downdraft then leaves a void behind it where the warm air rises behind that moving storm front. And you get this vertical rotation, this wind shear. Now, because the ground topological differences, the ground isn't perfectly even, the storm front is not a perfect line, there will be regions where the updraft is particularly strong. And as a result, that rotating cylinder will begin to break up. And one part of it in an area with a particularly strong updraft will begin to tip. And that vertical rotation will begin to move to a horizontal rotation. That is the beginnings of the tornado. What really supercharges it, gives it that extra kick and all that destructive energy, is thermodynamic. The air at ground level is not just warm, it's also humid. When that air is drawn up into the updraft, it would naturally cool. It would become denser. And that updraft would peter out and you wouldn't get a great deal of force in the winds. But because of the humidity, as that water as that air is cooling, that water vapor begins to condense into water droplets. That's one of the reasons why you can see a tornado. It's not just the dust that it pulls off the ground. It is the water droplets, the fog that gets formed that allows you to see it. The process of condensing water from vapor to liquid releases a tremendous amount of energy. As a result, that rising air doesn't cool very quickly, and so it moves faster and farther than it ever would if the air at the ground level was dry. And that's what gives all the destructive energy to produce a tornado. So if we're going to build a tornado machine, we need three components. We need updraft, like I did with that fan. We need wind shear, and we need something to visualize it, some water droplets. Now, if you go on YouTube, you can find videos where they make one of these sort of freestanding tornado machines, and obviously they work. The problem with these things, though, is that the air velocities involved are relatively low. And so even breathing as I talk or somebody walking by can upset and disturb the vortex. You could see how touchy it was when I was setting it up. So most of the time when people try to build one of these tornado machines, they'll do so in an enclosure. And there's nothing in principle different about the student that builds their tornado machine in a cardboard box and this giant that I have behind me. It's 12 and a half meters tall. It's nearly three meters across. Other than scale, the same principles apply. However, in order to build something this big, we had to do some engineering to make it possible. And those engineering ideas you might find useful if you were to build your own tornado machine, no matter what size you build it. The first thing we did is we constructed six identical wooden panels. And then we hinged the panels into three pairs of panels that act almost like the covers of a book. By doing so, we were then able to take each one of these pairs of panels and set them up in a hexagonal arrangement to form a hexagonal cylinder like this. What's nice about that is that when you're done with this, you can simply fold these things up, you can stack them in the wall, you can put them on a trailer. They're easy because they're modular. In addition, what's nice about this is if you decide at some point you want to go from a small to a medium to a large chamber, you don't have to redesign anything, you just add more panels. For example, you could start with just a square two pairs of panels. Then as you add more panels, you can go to six, eight, ten. You could build a huge decagon. Also, if you didn't want to build enormously tall panels, you could build them, say, half as high. And then using this aluminum extrusion, this H extrusion, you can simply put this on the top of one set of panels, put another set of panels below it, and you could stack them indefinitely. Again, makes it convenient to use and easy. The way we created the wind shear is also pretty easy. If you look at this hexagon right now, I have all of the pairs of panels touching at their edges. However, what we simply did is we inset one set of panels relative to its neighbors like this. Oops, did that one wrong, like that. So that as the air enters, it has to enter along the edges of, did this, let's see, I did this wrong, hang on a sec. Want to get it right. Eh, that's better. You see how experience helps? 
In any case, now as the air enters, it has to enter along the edges and creates the wind shear. The nice thing about this setup is it's adjustable. So depending on how big you big build your chamber or how powerful your fan is, you can simply close and open up these gaps to optimize the performance of the formation of the vortex. It's very easy and it definitely does work. In addition, something else we did is at two very nearby corners of two panels, I drilled a small hole near the top edge. Then I simply took a cord like this, tied a knot in one end, passed it through one of the panels, and then just using a backpack type of clamp like this, I can squeeze the panels together at the top, creating a taper. This allows the air to enter more favorably toward the bottom as opposed to the top, again, strengthening the vortex and stabilizing it near the top. It's a nice feature and it's obviously super easy to do. Now, one of the problems we had is that you need windows here. And if we were to use glass for this purpose, it would be very expensive. And in addition, it would weigh a ton, literally, over half a ton. And if you were to use, say, polycarbonate or plexiglass panels, you'd save a little bit of weight, but it would cost even more. It costs thousands of dollars to build something this big. It's got a lot of windows in it. So what we elected to do instead is to take some 5 mil polyester film like this. This comes on a roll. I believe you can get this up to about a meter and a half, like five or six feet wide in rolls up to a couple of hundred feet wide. And it's extremely transparent, extremely strong, lightweight, inexpensive. We got this from US Plastics. And placing this is not that difficult. And let me show you how we did that. Now one modification we made to this particular panel, because this is so large, you can't just reach in with a little tray of some smoke. You actually have to get in there. So we stopped this plastic film a little short and I installed a thin plexiglass door with a couple of handles that allow me to actually get in the chamber with my own tornado. So let me show you. Now the other part of the structure that I want to discuss is the top, how we mounted the fan. And if you look up there, you'll see what looks like a black ring with these ribs sticking out, six of them. The way this supports the fan is that we cut a couple of pieces of plywood into circles. It doesn't matter what size you use. You, we used 0.6 meter, 24 inch diameter circles, but it's really irrelevant. What's important is that the hole in the center of each of these circles is different. The top circle you can't see has a slightly larger diameter hole and allows the fan to play, pass through it. The smaller, lower circle that you can see is slightly smaller than the outer rim of the fan. So the fan sits down on that lower disc and the upper one secures it in the center. Then these two discs are squeezed together and separated 
by the ribs, which act as a web between the two discs. This is a very rigid, very strong structure. You could sit on it. What's nice too is that you'll see those six bolts. Each of the ribs is actually secured at only one point. The nice thing about that is that you can then bend these things, move these things a little bit, so you can align them with the slots in the top of the center of each of the individual panels securing them. But it also means that if we distort the shape of the structure, because we are setting it up improperly or we're making these little gaps between the sides, it's not a perfect hexagon. These things can pivot, which allows you to adjust it to whatever shape you make. The other thing that's kind of nice is because they're clamped at only one point, when you're done and you want to store this, you can literally take the fan off and fold the individual spider arms, heck, octopus arms, put the six arms together, and it's much easier to store it and to transport it. Again, modularity is the key. Now, the fan that we're using is one that we had laying around. It's from a company called iLiving. We bought it on Amazon. And it's for this warehouse, and it actually has a capacity of 6,000 cubic feet per minute. Even for this very large chamber, it's overkill. We run this down at about 40% of its maximum capacity. So you don't need to get such a big fan, but I like the price of free, so that's the why we used the fan that we did. Now the last thing I want to point out is lighting. It's absolutely critical to be able to see the fog and see the tornado. If you light this from diffuse lighting around in the room, it's kind of washed out. So what we did is we installed some of these self-adhesive lighting strips. We bought these from a company called Govi, again, on Amazon. They're relatively inexpensive. And because they have self-adhesive on the back, you pull the backing off and you can simply stick them on the inside of the frame. Again, everything can fold together and you can store this very easily. These also come with controllers that allow you to turn them on, adjust the color, adjust the brightness, and you can even coordinate it to music. And we actually did that. It was kind of cheesy, but you know, it was a late night, a little bit of beer, and you have to admit, you'd do it too. So with that, let's fire this thing up and see what happens. So now I have my official tornado robe on, and I'm going to step into the chamber and get up close and personal with my own tornado. Feels nice in here. Let's see what happens. You can even up, get up close and feel the upflow. It's powerful. Despite how impressive this is visually, one of the things that this very large chamber allows you to do by getting into the chamber with a tornado is to feel the force up the updraft. I can feel a gentle wind against my face and the bottom of the robe, but as you approach with your hand and put your hand in the center of the vortex where the smoke is rising up to the fan, it's like somebody's pushing up on it. It's an impressively strong force. I was really 
more impressed with that than anything about the appearance of the tornado. So obviously it works pretty well. It's a lot of fun being in there. And it's amazing how powerful the updraft is right in the center where the fog forms. You can really feel the lift. It's pretty impressive. Now, we used dry ice. And there's an advantage to that because the droplets that are formed to make this visible are water droplets. So as they get sucked out through the fan and then deposited around the room, if you used a lot of it, you might get a little bit of moisture. But that's clean and it's going to evaporate. The downside with using dry ice is the fact that you have to source it and then when you store it, it evaporates on you. And that might be difficult. There's another option. You can use a fogger or a smoke machine. Now there's two different types. There's what's called a hazer and the other is sort of the classic fog machine. Hazers are often used in theatrical performances because it produces a very long lasting smoke. The downside is it's oil-based, so eventually when it settles down on surfaces, it can leave an oily residue behind. The fogger is based on a mixture of 70% water, 30% glycerin, and although it will leave glycerin deposits eventually over the surfaces, at least it's water-soluble, so it's a little bit easier to clean up. So your trade-off is cleanliness versus convenience. So let me show you how this works with a smoke machine. What's nice about this is you can do it remotely. Automatic tornado. So when they ask you the question, how can you stop a tornado? Unplug it. But personally, I like the effect of the dry ice a little bit better. It seems more impressive, and it lasts longer. And obviously, it's cleaner. So hopefully you found this interesting. And potentially, if you want to build your own chamber, I've given you some methods that you can use to engineer your own to make it convenient, modular, relatively easy to put up, and to store. And if you like the kind of stuff that we're doing in this channel, please take a few seconds and consider subscribing. It would really help us out. The bigger we get, the broader YouTube will spread our videos to a much larger audience and the more we can afford to bring you. We're hoping to hit a million subscribers this year and it's still possible. So with your help, we'll get there. In any case, I wanna thank you very much for watching. Take care, stay safe, and have fun.